Darker and closer. Everybody and welcome to another episode of The Birders Show. As always, I'm joined by my partner in crime, Diego Calderon from Medellin, Colombia. Diego, good morning. Hey, buenos dias, mate. How's it going? How's Bogota today? Beautiful sunny day. I see maybe not the same for you because you're uncharacteristically wearing a jumper. A little, a little overcast, a little overcast, but I can't complain. I mean, some days, some days have to be like that. Absolutely. And how's your birding been of late? Oh, I mean, it's not, it's not been a lot uh, outside the house, to be honest. I'm not going to talk again about my black phoebes nesting around because you know they're already gone but uh, you just you just it, did but we can we can forget that <laughs> <laughs> no it's been it's been great like you know like two three days ago i went to just deliver my garbage bags and the good thing of living in a rural area is that you have little trails and you know wooden areas so i basically went for a couple of hour birding uh walk yeah. i didn't see any birds i heard probably 20 25 but you know, I just I just enjoy being in the in the trail, mosses and, and beautiful aralia plants and cecropias and taking photos, uh, playing a little bit with with these uh, uh, wood hunters and some birds around. So so just I mean like enjoy my you know truly environs that are not urban per se, but you know they, they, I'm privileged too. So that's that's been a little bit just just slowly enjoying it. What about you? Um, I mean, I've been kind of saving my energy for my big birding trip, which is coming up in December, which we've we've talked about before. Bragging, bragging again, bragging again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> always bragging a little bit. But um, no, I, I, I did sort of in tribute to our guest today, who I'll, who I'll introduce in a second, uh, head out and do a little bit of urban birding um, with our, our videographer, uh, Julian, because, well, you know, we thought take advantage of the fact that we're here in Bogota. And we actually, I'll talk about it more a bit later on, but we went up to uh, Monserrate, the mountain just on the fringes of Bogota, sort of 3,000 meters to a new uh, a new trail they've opened up there with hummingbird feeders and a nice view of, uh, of the canopy. And we've got some nice species, got some nice species. Nice, even feeders, I didn't know. Yeah, really nice, yeah. And sort of, you know, sword-billed hummingbird, star frontlets, stuff like that, with a view of the whole of Bogota. I mean... It's a great spot. Um, but actually, speaking of kind of birding in urban spaces, that kind of brings me on to a little bit of uh, news that you and I were discussing earlier that kind of relates to our guest today, which is, well, you sent me a bunch of links earlier to look at, which were talking about how birding might actually well be the kind of hobby of the year in this year of kind of global lockdowns and stuff like that, as people look for ways to, to get outside in urban spaces that they're allowed to do, right? Like, you sent me a link about people in, in New York, in, in Central Park, getting out, birding in kind of unprecedented numbers, taking advantage of these green spaces that they had and enjoying the kind of therapeutic effect of birding, nature, being outside in, in green spaces. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I don't know about you, how you live in a, you live in a rural area, so it's a bit different for you, but, but you know. Yeah, I can't complain. I'm, you know, surrounded by, by birds and nature and green a lot, but even in Medellin, it's been happening that this therapy of birding has became quite the thing. So a lot of people is joining the local societies. I actually put a couple of books today here uh, that is like Aves from Universidad Nacional, from the campus of a university. And even this one is from, you know, Universidad uh, Javeriana in Bogota. There is, there is like plenty more resources. These books were published a year ago and people is just, you know, embracing that. And one thing that I love is that people is not only discovering and doing different hobbies and blah, 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 and getting out of the shopping mall, that is great, to go, you know, to their local park or local patch, but they're kind of empowering and feeling they ne their neighborhood a little, you know, more uh, them and proper. And I, I love that. I love that they're really connecting with whatever tiny nature is in their environs and they are just clicking. That's, that's lovely. I, I love that thing from those pieces of news from this year. I mean, but the reason we're talking about this is, is partly because it relates perfectly to our guest today. Uh, we're joined virtually in the Birder Show studio by David Lindo, aka The Urban Birder. Uh, David's a British bird watcher, author, broadcaster, tour leader, and educator, author of many, many books about uh, urban birding, including The Urban Birder and Tales from Concrete Jungles. 
Uh, he was named the seventh most influential person in wildlife by BBC Wildlife magazine. So, you know, we're joined by a pretty big deal today in the studio. David, welcome to The Birder Show. Listen, guys, thank you very much for having me. It's really good. A pleasure for us, mate. Absolutely. No, no, absolutely. And, and just, I mean, just to start off before we sort of get into the main conversation, um, what it, what's your take on this kind of increase that we're seeing in lockdown periods of people getting out and enjoying urban birding? That's a mission you've been trying to spread for, for years, I know. I think that it is actually, uh, COVID has been a blessing in disguise in some respect because people have suddenly connected with this thing and didn't realise was on their doorsteps. But I actually think and have thought for a long time that urban birding in particular is Ornithology's new rock and roll. People are getting on board and <laughs> I've always looked at it from day one as selling it to the masses, people outside of our world as a new kind of lifestyle choice like yoga or meditation. And I think that people are actually naturally taking that on board now. I mean, I've seen in London and elsewhere around Europe and the world, you know, people saying, oh, I'm hearing all this stuff. And you know, I feel good. I actually feel good. So it's, it's working, which is great. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's something I've noticed here in Bogota more and more sort of, you know, you go out in the park for a run or something and I'm the one running and I'm seeing birders all around. It used to be the other way around. There is this lovely measure of this that is the, like the Facebook groups. There is tons, tons, millions of new people just joining these bird Facebook groups and sending a lot of photos like, what is this? This was in my balcony. This was singing in my window. I mean, that's a really, really good thermometer to see like the increase, huge increase of people just, you know, appreciating their surroundings a lot. That's beautiful. So David, I mean, to go back, I wanted to ask you just to start off with a question I ask a lot of people who joined us on the show. How did all of this start for you? How did you first fall in love with birds? Well, I think the story is, and when I say I think the story is, you'll understand why I said that phrase. <laughs> um, it came from a previous life. I, me, I was a puma in a previous life. Mm, I like this. This is already great. This is already great. <laughs> I did what pumas do, which is, um, you know, hunt animals. And I think one day I went off to a bird and I got feeling, I, I got feeling I was in North America because I think in my mind it was a ptarmigan, a rock ptarmigan. I just remember in my previous life seeing a flash of white flying away from me. And I was thinking to myself, that looks amazing. So I became a birding puma. But it kind of led to my demise because I didn't eat. And just before I died, I thought, you know what, I've just got onto something really interesting here. I wonder if there's any chance I can carry this on in my next existence. And luckily, I was born as a human in Northwest <coughs> London um, with this innate interest in natural history. And it kind of started actually with invertebrates. I'm, I've been in my back garden looking at all these invertebrates and collecting them and I didn't know what they were, and there was no one around me who shared my interest, none of my family or friends or anyone, or their friends. And then I kind of started noticing birds, and again, I didn't know what they were. I thought that God was puppeteering them. I thought I was convinced I could see strings as they flew. <laughs> and then one day, when I was about seven, I went, to a, um, I went to a library and I found this book, and it was about birds of Britain, Europe, Middle East, and North Africa, and I couldn't believe it. It was like finding the Holy Scriptures, 1,020 odd species. I read this book inside out, back to front, sideways, upside down. I knew every single species, guys. I knew all their Latin names. I knew how big they were in inches. I knew all the plumages I came in. And I, by the age of eight, was a walking encyclopedia on birds of Britain, Europe, Middle East and North Africa, plus a little bit of the world as well. And it started from there. I did my 10,000 hours as uh, Malcolm Gladwell said. I think that's the best answer we've ever had to that question on The Birder Show. Diego, thoughts? I mean, we can, we can, we can just finish the show now. This is worth, you know, like, let's put it on loop. Let's put it on loop. Absolutely. Actually, where are you, where are you uh, the, 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 the puma, you, uh, were you a hunting puma or just a observing bird watcher puma in your past life? I was hunting originally. I was pretty good at hunting. I was actually living in a mountain range. That's what I think I was. You kind of withdraw from eating the birds at the moment? Oh, that's different now. <laughs> I've actually become a vegetarian recently. So no, I don't eat birds anymore. But basically, I just, you know, I just have, I'll tell you why I, have, I know this or feel I know this. When I was about eight, 
my mum got me this book. It's a really big book, which seemed big, big to me as a kid. And it was called Animals of the Americas. And I was looking through it and I was seeing all these weird things like spider mm. monkeys and, you know, bird, uh, birds from North America, like American swallowtail kite. And I turned the page and there was a puma. And I thought, I know you, I know you. <laughs> and that was a connection. I've never seen one, by the way. I think I was near one in Los Angeles and uh, I was in a, a canyon actually near Los Angeles and I've heard a rustle in the bushes and it wasn't a deer. I felt it was a puma, but, but I've never seen one. So I think when I do see one, I'll be bursting out in tears and probably run over and try and hug it. There is a trip for you there, Torres, Torres del Paine in Chile. So, so David, you, you mentioned uh, that you're from Northwest London uh, originally um, and I mean, you're more well known now within the birding world as, as the urban birder. Can I ask how that kind of persona, how that identity came about? 14 years ago, I was just a mere mortal. Uh, I still am, actually, but I'm a, I was a mere mortal. And basically, I had an email out of the blue from the BBC, and it was requesting whether I wanted to, to, to be on a uh, programme called Springwatch, which is... Uh, the biggest sort of natural history program on British television to talk about my local patch in West London, my beloved Wormwood Scrubs. So I said, of course. So the, the night before the actual filming, um, I went to the hotel where the director and the crew was and the director was having a chat. She said, tomorrow, David, just get out there, enjoy yourself. Don't worry about anything. Just tell us what you know. It'll be great. So I said, fine. And then she said, um, uh, she asked me, can I, uh, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. She said, we'd like to give you a screen test. And I'm thinking, screen test? Me? Why? But outwardly I said, yeah, no problem. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> and I was pacing up and down thinking, I want to be the next David Attenborough. I wonder, what can I say? What can I do that can make me really shine? And then I thought to myself, well, maybe I can do what Jamie Oliver's doing. Because Jamie Oliver at the time had just come through and he was calling himself the Naked Chef. And I thought, mm -hmm. no one in my world has given themselves a moniker. No one's given themselves a brand. Maybe I should. So I like, well, even though I want to be like David Attenborough, clambering over rocks in Galapagos and going through jungles in Peru, <laughs> I can't see that happening. But I do like wildlife in, I do like wildlife in cities. So what about the city birder? No, no, no. Uh, the urban birder, that sounds all right. So the following day, I introduced myself as the urban birder. The idea was purely to get work on TV. I thought if I gave myself a little catchy <laughs> little name, I'll get loads of work. As it happened, the window of opportunity is tiny. And I didn't, yeah. you know, didn't really, didn't work for me straight away. And I quickly realised that, you know, it's more than just TV. You've got to be writing, you've got to be doing all sorts of stuff. And I also realised, because when the programme came out, they kept in the Urban Birder. And people, you know, contacted me saying, oh, what a cool name. It does what it says in the tin. It's great. And I realised that actually there was a job to do because there weren't people doing anything that I wanted to do in cities around the world trying to engage people. So then I just took the name on the Urban Birder, and it's stuck ever since. Well, yeah, it's a name that's become quite quite sort of catchy and popular. I mean, I see Diego, I can't really make out the full T-shirt that you've got on, but there we go, Urban Birder. There you are. There you are. You can get them all over Colombia. <laughs> um, I'm interested to know because... You know, urban birding has become something that you're synonymous with. Um, but obviously, you're, you're, you're a birder at the end of the day anywhere in the world, you know, like you, you know, cities, open areas, countryside. Um, but Wormwood Scrubs, you mentioned your local patch in London. Um, can you tell us a little bit for those who maybe aren't as familiar with sort of London geography? What is Wormwood Scrubs? Where is it? What, what are the kind of birds you're seeing there? OK, Wormwood Scrubs is a large park in West London surrounded by urbanity. I mean, everywhere you look, there's housing, there's industry, there's even a prison of the same name, a notorious prison called um, Wormwood Scrubs, which is actually quite good it's there because in the beginning it stopped people from going because they were scared they might bump into a jailbird. I've never <laughs> recorded a jailbird in 25 years of birding there. But basically, <laughs> there's no standing water. It's basically um, sports fields, most of it. And there's an area of rough grassland, which isn't very big. And then pockets of woodland, which isn't very 
thick either. So it's very, quite habitat wise, it's not brilliant. But I discovered it back in the early 90s and I always love exploring new places, particularly within urban areas and particularly places that people don't go to to watch birds. And I started mm -hmm. going there as a project. I remember the first lunchtime I went there in August 1990 or whenever it was, I didn't see much. The second day I didn't see much. The seventh day, on the seventh day, guys, it's almost biblical. On the seventh day, <laughs> I found a tree pipit. <laughs> On the eighth day, wow. I found the common red star. On the ninth day, I, sat, I found a pied flycatcher, and that was it. I was hooked. These birds are scarce migrants in London. And over the years, I realised that this place was actually quite a magnet for, for migrating birds. Um, initially, I wasn't believed with some of the stuff I found, but then over a period of time, it became part of the ornithological map. It was on the map in the UK. I mean, I found some really interesting rarities there. Uh, Ortolan bunting which is a Mediterranean wow. species. Mm -hmm. It was, I think, the 13th record for London in 120 years. Uh, common rose finch is another bird which has only been found three times in the last 20 years in London. Mm -hmm. And other birds like Richard's pipit from, from Siberia. So there was all sorts of interesting rarities. Plus, there was a, a host of birds that were nesting that were scarce, not only locally, but even nationally. For example, song thrush, which is a bird which is fairly obvious to most people in Britain and in Europe, but in London it's not, in fact, in fact in Britain it's been declining. So we've got like 13 or had 13 different territories in the in the park, which is by the way, 183 acres. So it's not huge, but it's, it's big yeah. enough for London. And I also discovered a breeding colony of meadow pipits, um, six pairs, which were the closest to central London. Meadow pipits are essentially birds of open land, moorland, in the middle of nowhere, yet to find a colony within central London and in an area of grassland traversed by dog walkers on a daily basis was absolutely amazing. Sure, there, yeah. Wow, yeah. And how many, how many species uh, up to this point have you recorded in uh, Wormwood Scrubs? I think I've recorded over 150 different species. Wow. So basically, uh, over the years, there's been so many different types of uh, birds. We've seen, like, for example, great grey shrike, uh, quail. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, the wader list is incredible, too. I mean, despite the fact there's no water, I've recorded things like uh, wimbrel, Eurasian curlew, common sandpiper, mm -hmm. you know, even jack snipe. And one of the best water birds I've seen um, at the scrubs actually flying over was an Eur Eurasian bittern one New Year's wow. Eve. So, hmm. but the, the great thing about the scrubs for cool. me is the fact that it's a great example of going to uh, an innocuous place, a place that you would never expect to find anything, and watching it. Mm -hmm. And you'd be amazed as, as to what can turn up. And it's a great advertisement for looking up because most of the species i've seen have been flying over so look up yeah. no i mean to be honest it's good advice because in in such urban areas you know a lot of migrants traversing big cities like london so you never know i remember when you were here in the columbia bird fair you were doing a talk and i, I saw you do that talk you were talking about um an experience kind of sky watching as it were for birds of prey from one of the, the top of was it the shard one of london's tallest buildings um tower 42 Tower 42, that was the one. And you saw some kind of remarkably surprising birds of prey that you would never expect to see over London. I mean, can you talk us a bit through that experience? Yeah, that was interesting because I saw this building and I've always had this, it's interesting getting on top of a building to watch migration, even in the middle of the city. So when mm -hmm. I asked the management of the building, I was lucky that day. They told me afterwards that had it been the day before, the day after, they would have said no. But they actually said, well, why not, you know? Because I sold it as an idea that it will make the building look green and good for the environment and all that sort of stuff. So we set yeah. up the Tower 42 Bird Study Group and the whole idea was to not actually watch for migration. My idea was to alert the media to this idea that if you look up, you'll see birds. And of course, mm -hmm. they, they, they bit. I said, how can you be watching for birds in central London? This is just concrete and steel. I can, you know, so... I got them on top as well. But mm -hmm. what was interesting was that we did actually see migration. Um, in London, there's roughly about 24 pairs of kestrel. So not kestrel, sorry, peregrine. 
Um, it's the biggest, okay. uh, outside of New York, the biggest urban uh, colony of um, or population of, of peregrines. So from on top of the Tower 42, you, you can see at least six territories. We've seen honey buzzard. We've seen um, marsh harrier, hen harrier. I mean, it's just incredible the number of species flying over. And it wasn't just birds of prey either. You know, sandwich tern flying up the Thames and uh, kittiwake, um, black-legged black kittiwake. It was just incredible the numbers of stuff you can see. But again, for me, it's no real surprise because anything can turn up anywhere at any time. That talk I gave when you saw me, do you remember the end when I was, I was talking about the fact that um, a friend of mine and yours as well, we went out to Sonso and on the bus um, to Sonso Lagoon uh, near Cali in Colombia, he said to me, it's four in the morning, he said, I've never seen an owl before. And I said, what? I said, listen, I'm going to find you an owl if it kills me. We got to Sonso and you know Sonso, it's basically a wetlands with very small areas of woodland. We walked into mm -hmm. the first area of tiny woodland, we looked up and there in the tree was a tropical screech owl. And mm. I put my arm around him and that was an emotional moment for him, for both of us, we'll never forget it. <laughs> but interesting, after, uh, interestingly, after that talk, yeah. I think people went out of the, the, the auditorium or the tent we were in and there was an owl on a branch in the tree outside, wasn't there? Do you remember that? There was, it was a, um, what was it? It was a striped owl, I think. Where with the ear tufts, so if I think so, yeah. Um, Probably right. One of the common ones in Cali. Yeah. See, that's an yeah, example. Yeah. That's an example of the force. The force is always with <laughs> us. Yeah. And they and they look up, look up. I mean, always. That as you said. Look up always. I actually saw my first peregrine in Colombia in Cali, in the main square in Cali, hunting pigeons. Cali is a good city for uh, for peregrines as well. Um, and actually, it's interesting that you mentioned the Eurasian bittern in London because we were chatting uh, with. Ariane uh, Dwarshus in our last episode, a Dutch bird, the holder of the global big year record. And we were talking about bitterns. And my favorite urban birding experience in London happened two years ago. I went back and went for the first time to the WWT Wetland Center in London. Um, I'd never been before. And when I was young, in sort of the mid, mid 90s time, a young birder, seeing a bittern in the UK was a, 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 almost a mythical thing. We had to travel off to you know, Minsmere on the Suffolk coast and hope you got lucky and maybe you'd see one. And, and I was in central London watching a bittern fishing 10 feet in front of me from a hide in this WWT reserve. And it was, it was absolutely astounding to think that I could see that in the heart of the capital. And so I was interested to ask you, you said, you know, you've been going to Wormwood Scrub since the early 90s. How has urban birding for you changed in London and around the world in the time that you've been kind of pushing this as, as, as an activity? That's a very good question, actually, Chris. Basically, in the early days, and, and when, I, when I talk about early days, I, I'm talking about even before then, when I was a kid, it was something mm -hmm. that people kind of looked at you and thought, what are you doing? Why aren't you going somewhere proper? Why are you, when migration time comes, why, why aren't you going to a headland? Why are you going to the middle of a city? And for me, I always had the, th the thought that migration occurs on a broad front, that birds occur everywhere, um, you know, just look up and you see. And, and I've seen that throughout my life. So to convince people was very difficult at first. Even birders, um, you know, seasoned birders would live in a city but never bird there. They'd go out in the countryside at the first given the, uh, opportunity. And I think over the years, I mean, my whole thing when I was born as a urban birder, born again 14 years ago, my whole thing was to try and engage people outside of our circle um, because they're new to it. They don't understand. And I think a lot of people, as people still do think this, but they kind of thought that you need to go somewhere to see things. But when you actually look at the numbers of birds that turn up in metropolitan areas, I mean, think about London. 370 different species have shown up in London, some first for the country turning up in mm. London. I mean, the other day... I heard that there was a slate-coloured junco uh, in someone's garden in London. First one yeah. for London. And you'd think that the whole British list is 620 different species. And to think that 95% of all those birds have turned up, to, uh, turned up in urban areas is quite interesting. Urban areas, mm -hmm. despite being poorer when it comes to habitat, there is still habitat there, often much more condensed, which means that when you watch birds in those areas 
you actually see them a closer because often the birds become used to humans but also in much higher mm-hmm. densities and anything can turn up anywhere so it's just a it's to me it's a really exciting prospect and over the years i've noticed certainly in britain and in in america and americas that the attitude towards urban birding has really become much more oh let's get into it we're really interested in this in Europe, it's slightly different. I mean, people understand it, but when I walk around a city in Europe, particularly in Eastern Europe, you're looking. People are looking at you like, "What are you doing?" You know. So they still don't really mm-hmm. get it. I mean, for example, I lead tours to Serbia, northern Serbia, and I go to a place called Kikinda, right on the border with Hungary. It's the best place on the planet to see long-eared owls during the winter. You can I can lead a group for four days around that area and see upwards of 500 owls without any problem in the streets wow. on the trees. When I first turned up 12 years ago, the locals were like, "Now people are coming up to you, tapping on the shoulder, come and see my owls." They're now selling <laughs> owl paraphernalia, owl t-shirts, owl mugs, tea towels, you name it. Owls are called sova in Serbian. So they've renamed November, Savember. Kids dress up as owls in school <laughs> for the whole month. So it's become very much part of their lives, even though it was part of their lives before that. But before then, they used to kill them. Now they see them as a great opportunity to make money. So ecotourism has really helped out. So I think that's another positive benefit of urban birding. It makes people realise that even within urban areas, there's habitats worth protecting. You know, so I think there's a really interesting thing that's come from this. It's not just, you know, a little pastime. It's actually a business, but also it's allowing people to connect to nature. And people in urban areas live in bubbles. So it's really good, a good way to get people to to notice nature purely by opening their window, walking out onto the street and looking up. And actually, actually this, I mean, you mentioned this beautiful change, you know, like people getting getting this connection and feeling empowered and stuff but you know like probably still in a little bit one of the one of the questions from the audience that i was talking with lena a friend from the humboldt institute recently i mean she was wondering how how birders not not the people that's not a birder yet but how birders have probably changed the concept the concept of trash birds you know with the urban birding something that some people don't like it some people say without being derogative well how how does change i mean is, is people more birders more aware that the so-called or badly called trash birds are great birds and interesting stuff and etc yeah i think this trash bird thing um i see it more in america than i do in europe we don't actually talk about stuff like that or don't label birds as trash birds but yeah, it's an expression. It's an expression I'd never come across till I came to to C- Colombia. It's, it's not. It's not a sp- expression we use in the UK really at all. I don't think. Right. However, there are people I think that kind of say just or only mm. for two words, two yeah. four-letter words that I try not to use, and I ban mm-hmm. people who are with me from using because any bird is amazing. You know, sparrow, anything is amazing. Indeed. And I think also. What urban birding taught me was to look at everything because you had to work so hard to find anything. You know, you can't be in a lovely mm. wetland or up a mountain. You are in the street, so you have to work hard. So it taught me to look at everything twice. And that way you suddenly discover other things. And also by getting to know the common birds, it makes you a better birder because then you know the common birds so well that when something turns up that isn't acting, even from the corner of your eye, isn't acting like you normally expect. You are honed onto it immediately. And I think a lot of the problems today is that a lot of, um, there's, there's a fashion really to to go from point A straight to Z, you know, try and get a list as quickly as possible, you know, see as many birds as possible. And I question that in many ways. I'm not sure if you learn from that other than just ticking down names on a book or in a, in a program on, a, on, a, on an app, you know. I really, you know, I'm from the old school. I think it's really good to go birding. And when you go birding, you actually watch birds and you're not necessarily just looking yeah, for, exactly. for for new birds. To enjoying take enjoying the path, enjoying the, the way along. 
That's actually really interesting what you said about how, you know, the more you know common birds, the more you're able to notice when something isn't a common bird. Because particularly in, in the UK, a lot of our rare migrants turn up in sort of winter plumage. They're not birds we're familiar with. And it's tiny, minute details that you have to notice to kind of differentiate species. So that's actually a really good tip out there for anybody watching is get to know the common birds so that when the rare ones turn up, you notice the difference. I mean, speaking of of you know, amazing urban birding spots around the world. I mean, I live here in Bogota. I'm quite kind of blessed with with urban birding in, in Bogota. It's a huge city, but we're surrounded by or full of little wetland areas and we've got the mountains to the east and even an endemic bird named after the city, the Bogota Rail. So, you know, we have a, a good bird list here in Bogota. Um, what are some of your favourite cities around the world to go birding in? That's always a very tough question to answer because, you know, <laughs> every city has its merits. <clears throat> There's some cities that are com amazing. I mean, Nairobi. Um, I remember going to Nairobi. I went to the Nairobi National Park, which is right on the edge of the city, and I had 220 species in the morning, um, which was mind-blowing. But even within the city, there's parks where you walk through an area of grassland and you're flushing this, flushing that. You know, it's just amazing. Um, I've got a few favourite cities in the US. I mean, Los Angeles, weirdly enough... Um, despite you know the thought that you think it's just concrete and flash models and big cars and that sort of stuff there's lots it's actually a coastal city um so there's lots of interesting areas that attract migrants during an appropriate season and you know a lot of well not a lot but there's still some wetland areas as well so i like going there um in europe um well i'm situated in spain at the moment so I have to say that the city I'm in now, Merida in Extremadura, um, that's a, a hot spot. But there's other places like Malaga. I mean, Helsinki up in um, in Finland and in, in England, Britain. I mean, I love London. That's where I come from. There's cities all over the world. I think it's easier to ask me what cities I didn't enjoy. Uh, I mean, are there cities, are there cities you just, you thought this is not good for urban birding, that there are cities like that? I think, as I said, I think every city has its merits, but the city I didn't, in, I didn't enjoy birding in was Moscow. Um, my experience okay. there wasn't great. I found it a very racist place. I, I didn't feel comfortable. I felt in danger the whole time, basically. So um, I didn't enjoy Moscow. I want to go back, hopefully, with someone who can show me around, maybe show me the other side of the city, but I didn't enjoy mm. it when I was on my own. And also, funny enough, when I went to Santiago, um, or Santiago in Chile? Is it Santiago? Or Santiago? Mm -hmm. Santiago. Mm -hmm. yep. Santiago. Yeah, Santiago. Capital. I was surprised because I really worked hard and I only saw maybe 15 or 16 species in the city. Um, and I was surprised. And then I realised that the, the, the density of species is less than, you know, further north in South America. So I kind of readjust, mm -hmm. readjusted my expectations after that. But that was a, a surprise. But having said that, I still had a great time. And it's actually a really nice way to kind of get to know a city. I think if you don't know a city before, it takes you walking to the green spaces. You kind of maybe see the city from a different perspective. But I mean, I know that you've birded in Cali in Colombia before because that's where we met for the first time. You're an ad, you're a um, a representative of the Colombia Bird Fair. Uh, have you birded in any other urban areas or outside of urban areas in in Colombia? My experience at Colombia is quite limited, to be honest. I mean, apart from going to places like Sonso, Sonso uh, Lagoon and a few other places nearby um, Cali, no. I mean, I was meant to lead a tour uh, to Colombia in April this year, which would cover quite a few areas, um, but unfortunately COVID put pay to that. So I've yet to experience all those things. You know what's interesting, though? As much as I, you know jungles and forests are amazing they're actually my least favorite locations for birding and i think it's partially down to the fact that i'm an urban birder you know because i was brought up in open spaces away from forests yeah. and stuff so i'm used to looking at wetlands i'm used to looking at rooftops and stuff i suppose and being in in forests and jungles i find it difficult to retain my interest when I'm led by someone who's playing tapes, who is saying, oh, that in the background is whatever, it doesn't excite me. And okay. I, I'm not excited when, 
you know, someone takes me by the hand and says, right, you know, we're going to find loads of species and basically 80% of them are found that way. It doesn't, yeah. I, I, I think, again, it's down to the facts of what I'm used to. I'm used to kind of eking out things myself. And I'd almost much rather, if I see something in that situation, do it that way than try to lure the bird to, to me. You know, I, mm -hmm. it doesn't excite me. But apart from that, you know, I'd like to uh, explore Colombia far more than I have. I think you would really love the Eastern Plains region of Colombia based on the way that you just said about, you know, how you like to go birding, this kind of wide open grasslands and flooded wetlands full of, you know, water birds and little skulking pipits and little patches of forest. That's a great place as well for kind of self-found birding, right, Diego? I mean, you and I have birded there a lot. He would love it. And, you know, I can compare that to last February. I was with David actually birding around Extremadura. And sometimes these guys were absolutely in heaven in these huge, you know, pastures and savannas. And I was a little, a little bored, you know, I was like trying to get something a skull key, probably whistling <laughs> a little bit of its song. And they were all with their scopes. You would love David, the Janos, the Eastern Plains. Absolutely. I mean, that's, it's not only the way you like to, to, to get the birds and see them. It's just, you know, your habitat, your, your, I, I love, I love the white sand forests of the Guyanese soils in, in Eastern Colombia. You love more urban, you know, kind of skulky areas for birds. Uh, we, we all have our preferred, you know, habitats. That's it. You know, I'm an English birder transplanted in Colombia, and, and we've noticed here before comparing notes that Colombians are typically kind of forest birders. It's just the overwhelming habitat here is forest, is jungle. Colombians love that kind of birding and are less engaged perhaps by water birds, shorebirds, those kind of species. As an English birder, those are my favorite types of birding trips. I absolutely love those types of birding trips. You know, get to the coast, picking out little wading birds in flocks and stuff like that. And it's one of those things that, yeah, Diego, you've said so yourself. I remember talking to you and you're like, it's just not your cup of tea, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, you, you can have people doing both, like David in his past life. You, you, you were a mountain lion, a puma in the north. You probably, you know, <laughs> used the, the great American interchange to come a little southern to the neotropics. So you, you might still have your, you know, primordial primitive forest stuff anywhere. I just think it's fascinating how we are very different in the, our preferences when it comes to birding. Because you always think mm -hmm. of birders when, well, I suppose outsiders think as, think of birders as just birders, you know. But in reality, as you say, we have our niches. I mean, even though we can operate in all of them, you know, some are more favourable than others. No, absolutely. And um, it, it's, it's one of those things that it, it may be urban birding typically has not been a niche that many people sort of exclusively occupy. Like you said, Colombians are forest birders, British birders are maybe wetlands and shore birders. But do you think increasingly people are identifying themselves first and foremost as city birders? Is that something that's changing? I think that is changing, but I think it's, I think it's more to do with newcomers coming into it. I think newcomers mm. don't know the old sort of landscape and they see themselves you know, as urban birders, because what I try and do is sell it to them as a, as a new discipline, even though obviously birding is birding. Um, and there is a certain sort of cachet to it because I think finding interesting birds within an urban area sometimes is more uh, valuable to them than it would be if you found the same bird in its natural habitat or, you know, outside in the country. I think, you know, and that's the thing that really attracts me to it. I like, well, one of the things, I mean, I love the idea of finding something you just didn't expect and something that you'd normally expect to be in a rural situation or in the middle of a wetland somewhere, but there it is in the middle, middle of a city. It's just really interesting. And I love, for me, it's very beautiful. I love seeing this, this creature with the backdrop of human-made stuff. It just sends a message which, for me, is a message of hope in that this bird is not necessarily here by accident. It's here as a messenger to show us that this is what we can have if we, you know, protected our environments. And our environments start from our doorstep, not somewhere distant that you never will go to, not somewhere on a David Attenborough program that's actually right in front of you. And to discover those things is amazing, even if it's a bird that is commonly seen. But for non-birders, like for example, I take people out around in Britain and you show them a goldfinch or 
has you got in your cup of bullfinch and it's mm-hmm. like yeah. oh my oh my I'm, I never expected that to be here and they've been there all the time just that they don't expect to see it so they don't see it which is another issue yeah. because some birders um, ex- more experienced birders they just don't accept or don't even want to think about the, the fact that something could turn up they have a list of birds and that's the list that's that's what that's what's going to turn up whereas I always think to myself that's the list but anything else could show up you know and I, and that's yeah. what I'm looking for I'm looking for new things the whole time it's, it's not either white or black it's, it's, it's tons of you know different colors of, of gray in between I mean it's pleasure for everyone that, that's one good thing about birds they pleasure us uh, on, on different levels and different ways and different niches absolutely easy I mean they are, they are for everyone absolutely um I, I think well now seems as good a time as any to get on to some questions from our audience we when we knew you were coming on David we, we put that out on our social media channels and we got some questions from our from our viewers and uh, should I kick off Diego with the first and then you you can ask the second one uh, uh, absolutely go ahead go ahead I was I was busy with this couple of southern lab wings in the in the pasture just here about little mound. I thought I could hear them calling. I thought I could hear them calling on your I saw on your, your face. I saw your face earlier when they were calling. You were like, Aah! That can be a separate micro list I can have. Birds I've heard through Diego's Zoom audio while recording the Birder Show. <laughs> um, so our first question, uh, David, is from uh, our sound guy, actually, for this show, uh, Daniel Murcia, uh, who, who asked, what would be your, your number one bit of advice uh, for people living in cities who want to get into birding? Like your, your first key bit of advice. Let me actually just just before you you, you go with that like Dan, Dan Daniel is our sound engineer and he was in all the birders documentary phase a couple of years ago but probably from the crew he was the one that haven't fall yet like totally in love with birding yet he's a little bit so he's probably I mean like you know itching to <laughs> to, to get some of these tips go ahead mate I think the first thing is to open your mind um, simple as that open your mind to the possibilities of seeing interesting birds i think um not to worry about identification so much initially just enjoy what you have around you for what it is and all the other stuff will come later there's no rules to follow in terms of you know, there's no exam to take there's no certain amount of species you need to see by a certain time do it at your pace if that means that you are forever just looking at your garden birds or never taking it further than that that's great if it means you become like Diego or Chris and go out and do stuff and go <laughs> traveling around the world that's great you know it doesn't matter you do what you want to do but the most important thing is to enjoy yourself and to fall in love he's in the background now thanking thanking us yeah. I have I have a, a good one from Alberto that is a local birder here in Medellin Kind of, kind of a urban person, and he leads tours in the city. And he's interested to know, uh, David, mate, how local governments should reinforce or support local urban activities, you know, already made by the cities, to keep it popular and actually to, to be in line with all the infrastructure that they already built. Like this city of Medellin, they already have trails in the parks, some blinds, feeding stations. Like these things are forgotten how what you know local government should do to keep using these things and people you know in love with urban birding or interested in urban birding yeah that's a good question that's a big question as well because you know it depends on what you know local governments you're talking about because some are some are more willing to listen than others but i think it's about promoting these areas um as being able to be visited to to, to maintain and manage those areas as well. But also, more importantly, to, to do a lot of outreach, not only to the local population, but make it part of what this area or what this city is about. It's part of its identity. So an example would be in Berlin, in Germany, they have the biggest population of northern goshawk nesting and uh, breeding within the city. Yet the average Berliner doesn't know that. The average Berliner doesn't realize that if you go to the Tiergarten, which is a main park in the middle of the city, you can see six pairs of this amazing bird. For me, if I was in the local government or if I was one of the people on the ground, I'd be lobbying the government to say, have this as one of our national or city-wide treasures. 
when you drive into the city, it should say, welcome to Berlin, the historical center, or whatever, or whatever, blah, blah, blah. but also the biggest population of northern Goshawks in the world. Indeed. Get people Indeed. feeling yeah. proud. They feel great. We've got yeah. something amazing. You need to come. And it's also a selling point. So use it to, even in the most basic things, use it to generate money and interest in your local area. If you're going to have to bring it down to basic levels, even to say that is, a, is better than doing nothing. And, and, actually, and actually, some towns in Colombia and cities, they're choosing their, you know, like the local bird, their national, you know, bird, and, and doing a lot of campaigns, murals. So this is, this is a beautiful, beautiful answer there. Uh, so our next question, uh, David, comes from Jorge de Leon. And Jorge asks, your advice for Latin American birding and environmental organizations to promote and inspire ethnic minority groups in outdoor activities like bird watching and, and nature observation, especially in large cities and urban areas? That's another good question. And I thought I had the answer for that until I went to Brazil um, a couple of years ago. And I was chatting, I, I went to a bird fair there, um, Avistar, and they had a round table about that subject. And I didn't realize mm. that it was so stark in that uh, families within the sort of black community uh, often didn't have money to buy binoculars and stuff like that. In fact, the person I spoke to said that you needed to have white pockets, which I kind of didn't understand at first. And then when she, she explained that uh, white people tend to have more money than black people, so therefore could afford it, then mm. I realized. So... I mean, before then, my answer would be to, you know, again, it's all about outreach um, within those communities. It's about also having role models uh, out there so that people can look and say, oh, he looks or she looks like me. I can get involved in this as well. But it's a very complicated story because, for example, in the UK, we have probably the best sort of natural history industry in the world. Um, you know, David Attenborough is a king here. And, um, and there's programming all the time about natural history. And there's problems here as well in Britain because there isn't enough ethnic minorities involved. There's not enough uh, role models at all. It's still very white and middle class in terms of what they produce. And also mm -hmm. it's very much um, very formulated, very form formulaic in that it's always the same thing that you see on TV. But then elsewhere, in like the Americas, North America and Canada and places like that, you've got TV channels churning out jaws, claws and fangs all day long. So you're feeding people with this idea that if it doesn't kill you, that it's not interesting. And also on top of that, you're mm -hmm. enforcing the idea that it's in the middle of nowhere. So you can carry on your life. You can watch this as a bit of entertainment, but it's not actually anything to do with you. So you've got a lot of these things that just drive a wedge between you and the environment and it's a massive job and I think I think the the great thing I love about the Cali bird fair uh, the Colombian bird fair in Cali is the fact that it's in an urban center the fact that they invite people to come people that live in the city to come and witness not only the uh, exhibitors and stuff but the the, 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 the talks as well and the talks are leveled at, at, at an, an audience that can understand. It's not a scientific scenario, which attracts people, gets people involved. And I think that's what you need to do in the absence of a general kind of greater media that can help put out programming about that sort of stuff. On the ground level, I think having festivals within cities to celebrate natural history, to show people that you can find that natural history within your very city is a massive thing to do. That's why urban birding for me is so important because it's about getting people within these areas out of their bubbles and realizing that they are actually connected to nature right next to them. Um, it's a very important thing. So I think that's a very difficult question to answer. And I think, you know, it, it, it's going to take a massive effort from a lot of people. And because cultures are so different, you know, there's no one size fits all kind of answer for everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, it's some good advice though to, to start off with. And, and, and the last question here from the audience now that you, you know, you, you've been talking about connecting people and nature all the time. Uh, Lina from the Humboldt Institute, she asks about what's your take on 
how eBird and iNaturalist and these platforms help connecting people and contributing, of course, you know, to these participative science things. I think eBird and all those apps that encourage people to record information are great. Um, however, we still need to, there still needs to be a bridge between the people who don't and the people who do. So in other words, it's all right for us, we're, we're in the world, we understand how it works, we're excited by it, we're sitting here chatting together about it, it's great. For me, and I'm sure for a lot of other people like yourselves, it's important to get the people outside of this world that we live in, that we inhabit, this space that we inhabit, to at least acknowledge and at least understand that they have a role to play that don't necessarily or will not necessarily become birders or, you know, ecologists or what have you, but they'll have an empathy towards it. And it's like what I've always said personally, I, I want to raise a conservation army, um, people who are sympathetic to the fact that we need to protect our environment, to the fact that there is something needed to be done about climate change. And they get involved, but in a maybe minor way, but they still get involved. So... I think things like iNaturalist is really good, actually, and, and similar apps like that, because it encourages people to go out and see something and think, what is that? And then they plumb it into the, the app and they find out. That is a step. That is getting them engaged in some way. So I think these, mm. these, these um, apps and these, these kind of functions are very good to try and bridge the gap between the people who are really into it and do it all the time and the people on the outside who who don't realise how close they are to being part of all that sort of stuff. So more of that, that's what I say. More, let's get more of that going on, really. OK. Uh, well, David, I mean, just to finish off uh, the conversation, we have a little kind of quick fire round of, of bird-related questions here for you. So just, you know, the first thing that jumps into your head. There's nothing, there's nothing uh, incriminating, don't worry. It's all fairly straightforward, but I'm sure you have answers to these questions. So to start off with, the classic, favourite bird. Ring oozle, a thrush from, uh, from the Western Palearctic. I think I saw my first ring oozle in the UK only a handful of years ago in the Shropshire Hills. It's not generally a common bird we have in the UK. You kind of have to go further afield. But have you ever recorded one in London? Yeah, I see fun. most of my ring oozles in London. Um, they migrate through yeah. my local patch, Wormer Scrubs, and I discovered that maybe 15, 16 years ago. Every single year, at least one comes through. So my favourite bird comes to visit me. That's nice. <laughs> uh, nemesis bird ringneck parakeet oh, oh, as in, oh come on as in you're against <laughs> ringneck parakeets oh because yeah because typically nemesis bird is like maybe people are thinking of a bird that they've tried to see that they haven't managed to see but that's the first time we've had like an enemy bird <laughs> only in places where it shouldn't be in India and in oh, the okay. sliver of Africa it's found that's fair enough but anywhere else that's fine okay um, dream bird to see Eskimo curlew I want to see one. I want to rediscover it. Okay. I like the ambitious. I like it. It's an ambitious answer. I like it. It's good. <laughs> uh, okay. So this one, I think I might know the answer to, but it, you could surprise me here. But it, so if you could only bird in one place for the rest of your life, one place, where would you choose? I have to be true to my roots and stay at Wormwood Scrubs. Let's say just to kind of broaden <laughs> it out a little bit, let's say Wormwood Scrubs is already off the table. Where would option two be? Oh, in that case... Um... That is a very tough question, but I would imagine it would be somewhere uh, in South America. Um, I I love, I mean, Sonso, Sonso is one of my favourite spots in Colombia so far. <laughs> so if I, if okay. I had a gun to my head, I'd probably say Sonso Lagoon right now, because I, I love it, I love being there. But there's many places, but I say there straight away. Okay, that's good. I mean, I'd love it. If you could get rid of the mosquitoes, I'd be at Sonso probably more often. But uh, <laughs> let me go. Let me go with one here. You're you're a puma in your previous life. You are a birder in this life. What's your next life gonna be? Musician. I'm gonna be a musician. I'm gonna be playing several instruments like Prince, um, and the the life after that, I'm gonna be a historian. Nice, nice. Okay. Well, actually, yeah. speaking of music and Prince, the next one is uh, your favorite bird song. Favourite bird song, that's another toughie, but I think um, it's got to be the Golden Oriole, probably. Nightingale's another one, but Golden Oriole always oh, yeah. brings up the hairs at the back of my neck when I hear one. In Spain, they're quite common. I hear them all the time, but I still love hearing them. 
Uh, and the final question is one that has divided opinion among our, our guests. Diego and I are on one side of the camp, but we'll see what you say. Binoculars, eights or tens, or maybe twelves? Tens, without any doubt, tens. Um, only because for me, tens work better over open landscapes, which I've, I've always used mm-hmm. all the time. So tens, with no hesitation. Okay, brilliant. He's in the wrong side. It's the forest birder versus open birder paradox, isn't it? It's the classic. Um, Because we're eights over here, but then we're looking in dark cloud forests trying to follow mixed flocks, you know. Okay, well, I think that about wraps it up for for this episode of the show. David, um, for anybody interested in following your your activities, your your publications, where can people find you online? Okay, if you go to my website, theurbanbirderworld.com, you'll find lots of stuff there. I've also got an instant... um, Instagram account uh, which I think it's called The Urban Birder and then Twitter um, I think it's at Urban Birder and Facebook my name David Lindo or The Urban Birder so all very simple places okay. to find me fantastic and as always we'll have all of the links to David's stuff below one other place Sorry. YouTube The Urban Birder channel YouTube, the Urban Birder channel. Well, we'll have all the links below in the description for people to, to follow along with your activities. And David, uh, an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us on The Birder Show. This has been a complete pleasure, guys, for, for uh, having you invite me onto the show. Um, it feels like a bit of a cult show, and I'm glad to be part of it. <laughs> Thanks for coming, mate. We enjoy you a lot, indeed, absolutely. Plus, we have a cult show. That's nice. I like that cult show. That's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> Uh, and well, Diego, as always, thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. See you, see you soon for the next one. But you know, next time. Indeed, indeed. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Ciao, ciao. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the Birder Show, and hopefully you feel inspired to get out in your urban area and do some birding. Thanks to David Lindo. Um, if you could just do us a massive favor and like comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to be kept up to date with all of our latest content from The Birder Show. 